This is a very personalized uh, view of laser for me, how I use it. Um, first of all, we're talking about plaque modification. I don't think we all have to go into great details, but you know, you, calcium is the, is the big em enemy here. And uh, we really want to be able to access the lesion for balloons and stents. You want to make vessel, vessel trauma, the minimize dissections, but most of all, getting back to Akiko, what we really want to do is enhance stent uh, expansion. This is what we're talking about, calcification. That's the enemy, and we know ample, multiple studies showing the association of calcific lesions with uh, increased MACE rates, including hard endpoints of death and myocardial infarction. We also know that calcification is increasing in the lab, and this is from last decade. I can imagine the, going back to this decade, it would, it's even higher with the aging population. Uh, what we've had here, of course, OCT has been a tremendous advance, really helping us quantify it and volumetrically, and something to keep in mind with OCT is a rule of five, which is, you know, a half a, uh, you know, a half a millimeter, uh, half of the uh, circumference and five millimeters of length is an indication for lesion uh, preparation. But to keep in mind is, again, to echo what Kiko is, when we're talking about dealing with calcium, we are, the, I, I don't know anything that debulked except for directional atherectomy, okay? We have, well, our goal is to thin the calcium or fracture the calcium. With atherectomy, with the rotational atherectomy and orbital, it's thinning it to allow it to be thin enough to fracture. And obviously, shockwave changes the equation a bit. But it's about calcium fracture for stent expansion. Now, where does laser fit into this? Well, this is the important aspects of laser. This is how lasers are built. You know, with a, with a, with a, with optics and a medium and excitation mechanism. Um, there's absorption, uh, depth mechanism, and losses, and uh, light can be you know dispersed, bounced, um, change in direction, deposited in a tissue. But the key is laser is monochromatic. They travel in phase together in parallel. And it's basically collimated and it stays focused over a distance. You know, you can shine it on the moon. There are three mechanisms of actions. One is photochemical, which is just making the, breaking the bonds. The other is thermal and the other is actually uh, mechanical, which is actually kinetic energy. Uh, we was just talking with the Kevin, a sledgehammer. Um, initially for the uh, photochemical, the UV light can penetrate 50 microns and actually break molecular bonds. And this is the quickest and shortest uh, um, effect of the laser. This is happening within 50, uh, 50 microns. Within maybe 100 microns, uh, well, actually a millimeter, you get a, you get a thermal energy here, which actually creates heat, and the uh, molecules break apart and cells rupture. And this is the ablative aspect of it. Remember, it's just this is a contact issue going, you know, literally a millimeter ahead of the of of, of the of the catheter, and the main the mechanism of action from the calcification standpoint is actually the the expansion and collapse of vapor bu bubbles, which actually can get a, up to 60, maybe even they just saw data today, maybe up to 100 atmospheres. This is the longest effect, and has actually the uh, the uh, the most uh, distant action. When you increase the pulsations, as you can see, say from 25 to 80 hertz, you can actually virtually um, almost a triple, a triple the time of ablation uh, when you actually increase air. And I'm actually a big favor of using the highest uh, energy. A thing to, thing to keep in mind is remember this, these catheters are over the wire. You have a dead space from the wire lumen. You have the peripheral dead space. The active ablative space is simply the cone of the uh, fibers, and that's it. It doesn't have any effects outside of that immediate contact part when you're just talking about tissue ablation. The speed is an issue here. Here's the two, three turbo, and here it is with fast advancements versus the slow advancements. And as you can see, by giving it time, you can ablate some, t uh, some uh, tissue, but remember this is a peripheral catheter, which, ha which is not quite what happens uh, um, in the coronaries. There's, this laser system has been updated. This is the newest model. I won't go into details, but it's a more contemporary, faster setup, easier regular plug, and a, an easier console to assess. The optimal technique is to minimize, when you're talking about ablation, it was actually to minimize the photoacoustic effect and minimize fractures and minimize dissections. So the original 
um, recommendations and the package recommendations is to uh, flush with saline to minimize the absorption and, uh, and, uh, and advance it slowly. And this is, as I said, maximize tissue ablation and minimize photo, photomechanical effect. And, but and the, the keep that in mind, but we're really, what I'm really we're using laser for by and large is a photomechanical effect, which isn't actually the contact effect, but it's actually a, a, it's actually a 360 effect in front of the catheter itself with the, va with the vapor bubble. And remember, you know, um, blood, uh, um, Blood has the highest level. If you just do it in, um, if you put it with saline, it minimizes this effect the most. Now, and if you actually, what I don't have in there is you put in contra contrast, it actually enhances it even more. Now, what can this be used for? Well, here's a case, actually, IJ, you and I did, uh, uh, IJ, I'm talking about, Alan, you and I did this. I don't know if you remember this. This is a right coronary artery, CTO, actually a dual occlusion. And here we are with the turnpike. We have a nice wire exit with a Gaia. Good job. Um, then we get a fielder XT across, at least into the, uh, uh, past the initial lesion. We make sure it's okay in our orthogonal view. And here we are with our fielder XT, a 208 balloon over with a, with a, a shear wire and the conus to anchor the guide and nothing crosses. Then we subsequently take a turnpike LP, a spiral, a caravel, one, two, five, and one, five balloons. Nothing happens. At that point, we have the wire across. We can't get a microcatheter. No, no, no ability to get any other a catheter through there. So we take a laser over the con conventional wire with a high fluency. We actually, that uh, fragments enough calcium, even though we don't fully cross it because of the calcification um, effects, the, the uh, fracturing effects, and remember, f saline flesh, which we wouldn't do anyway, um, is useless here because it's, there's really no lumen for it to get into, so it's basically dealing with it just pure plaque, and after that, the balloon crosses, the 3-0 balloon crosses, and uh, now we can advance our turnpike down. Uh, we can't see the distal vessel to reassure ourselves, so we do a very gentle a uh, very gentle anti-grade uh, uh, injection. We put the fielder XT distally, then we're able to balloon. And uh, we go into the, get a wire into PDA, and the, here is on the right is our final result. But I think that's the great use for, uh, for an uncrossable lesion when you have the wire cross and you have no ability to get a, uh, a, an atherectomy wire across. Stent under expansion. We know that's a, a huge issue, um, and, we've, and we, this is a series that was put together by Kiko in the core lab, uh, looking at pa comparing patients with OCT with ELCA and without ELCA with calcification. Um, it, this is an important aspect. I like showing this slide because it really shows the evolution of our techniques. If you look at, our, you look at the 300 lesions with instant restenosis, and look at the MSA in the bare metal era, the DES first generation and DES second, and look at the minimal stent area where we are with the second generation. It shows you, I call it the curse of the low profile stents, where they get in there, they look okay. We don't prep them as well as we did because the, you know, the bare metal would, you know, bulkier and needed more preparation. And stent, stent under expansion constitutes with the second generation in this, in this series, 70% of them, whereas in the bare metal stent era, it was only 28%, which is very telling about how our techniques have either evolved or devolved, depending on how you look at it. So this was a, to look at OCT to see whether ELCA has any effect on this in treating instant eustenosis during peri stent calcification. This is 92 lesions, all right, 26 with ELCA and 66 uh, without. This is just a good example of here is the uh, OCT before ELCA. You see the calcification encasing this stent, and here we are after ELCA and ballooning, and you can see, you know, massive fractures. This is a, uh, this is a, the, uh, the control group, which is just pre uh, circumferential calcification and post, as you can see, the area just went from 1.7 to about uh, 2.8, and the stent area increased uh, just uh, minimally. When it, this was an attempt at matching, and as you can see here, there really weren't any major differences in the, um, uh, in, 
uh, in the demographics of these individuals. And when you look at the procedures here, the actual balloon inflation and, uh, was, uh, was pretty much, uh, pretty much the, uh, uh, the same, the inflation pressure, though the balloons ended up larger uh, in the ELCA. Uh, and uh, we implanted, a, as you can see, a new stent in, um, in mo most of the non-ELCAs, but not into the, uh, into the uh, ELCA patients because of, the, um, uh, because of actually the uh, use of larger balloons. Most of the uh, laser uh, catheters here were 1-4. Uh, now, I think the, uh, the key, key findings here is when you, when you look at the uh, OCT findings, is you can look at the pre-MLA, which is pretty similar, but the post-MLA, um, when you look at the the post MLA, it's three six in the non ELCA and four eight two in the in the ELCA patients. And importantly, when you look at uh, calcium fragment fracture, the non ELCA was eighteen percent, and the uh, post PCI fractures were sixty was sixty one percent in the uh, in the ELCA, ELCA group. And the complete fracture was in half the patients, and you had very little of it in the uh, ELCA group. I think importantly, the, when you look at multivariate analysis, ELCA treatment and only single stents were the predictors of optimal stent expansion, uh, i.e. Uh, fracture. And in terms of mechanistic aspects, and this emulates vessel preparation in native vessels, what you look at the non-ELCA patients, you got, you, when, you had a, um, when you had a fracture without laser, what you saw was, um, uh, a maximum uh, thickness of about th uh, 250, 300. When you got to 400 microns, you did not get uh, a fracture. But you can see here, when you had fracture with the ELCA, you see it was, you, you could fracture up to 400 microns. So it really expanded your ability to fracture the deep calcium, which I think is an important message. So, and, and I think also interestingly here is that you saw multiple fractures more commonly with the, when you used um, contrast injections, when you use just saline injections, you did get fractures, but single fractures. So I think it's important to know that OC, in OCT findings, um, you know, ELCA is an important uh, um, driver of actually calcium fracture and optimal stent expansion when you have stent under expansion due to calcification. And um, in the non-ELCA group, Calcium arc was associated with uh, uh, non with stent expansion. On the other hand, ELCA group did, did not have a significant association. Therefore, the thickness of the calcium becomes less relevant when you're dealing with uh, with the with uh, ELCA. So, um, oops, this is going. Oh, sorry. So, ELCA is effective in treating ISR with under expansion by disrupting peristent calcium. And it can be particularly helpful in lesions that are crossed through the wire, but are uncrossable with any other devices. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Any questions uh, really briefly on either laser or basic IVIS? And we can save the IVIS questions for during Andrew's talk, because that's going to go through. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. So when you're using uh, laser for instant uh, restenosis for whatever mechanism, yeah. are you even wasting your time at a lower pulse rate or? I, honestly, I don't. And also without contrast, or do you just go with contrast and just treat it aggressively? Uh, I generally, if you know, if it's a, it's a, if it's an underexpanded stent with defined calcification, I go to I use contrast in it initially. I, I think it. I mean. You could theoretically just try it and get the fracture. You know, you do get fractures with the saline as well, but usually we're dealing with very stubborn cases where we've taken balloons already up to you know twenty odd atmospheres. So I just generally I generally go to eighty eighty and give a contrast injection. I agree because most of the time it's wait you're wasting your time and, yeah. and energy. Yeah, I think the key no thing though is, is yeah. <laughs> We typically, though, will image first because if it's neointima, yeah. then you know it's less clear cut that the laser is going to have yeah. as as great an effect. 
That's really not well known. There are people who do laser for every ISR case they have, but I think for the most part, um, the, the, the best is the, the, the best sort of evidence that we have to date is really for the cases of the under expansion where you're trying to expand it further. The, the cadence we use for these cases is to balloon them, image them, see the calcium, see the under expansion, and laser them. I've also had the sense that ballooning, by making some room, if you're lasering on contrast, which of course is off label, the main risk is no reflow. So if the, if the lumen's a little larger and the artery's perfusing a bit while you do that, we've seen less no reflow as a complication. No reflow in a series we have is only about 4% in 300 cases, half of which are on contrast. So it happens yeah. infrequently, but some of the stuff you can do to minimize is let the artery rest or have yeah. flow between runs. But the key thing is a slide that Akiko showed where she had four <laughs> different ISR cases and four different mechanisms. If you think about what people do around the world is everybody just puts in another drug looting stent. That's just the therapy, and that's not going to be the right way to treat those things because the mechanisms are all different.